Welcome to Fluid and Electrolyte Basics. Man, it's taken me a long time to get this one done. I feel like I've been working on it. I've probably been working on it three weeks, just trying to make it as simple as I can for you. So I hope that's what it's going to show you. This is just the basics of fluid and electrolytes. And then there'll be another video for fluid and electrolyte disorders. Please note our standard disclaimer in the small print to the left basically states that we do everything we can to provide accurate, up-to-date information. However, this video is not designed to replace your professor's information, but instead to supplement it. So homeostasis really means constant stability. And we know that our human body works best when some conditions are kept within a really narrow range of normal. Things like our temperature, electrolytes, pH, blood volume, those kind of things. And so our body has mechanisms in place to control homeostasis. Things like sweating or ves and vessel dilation when we're, when we're in hot temperatures. In terms of fluid volume and composition, homeostasis is very important for the body um, because the amount of water or the electrolytes affects the functioning of all cells, tissues, and organs. The body fluids are in constant motion, transporting nutrients, electrolytes, and oxygen to the cells while also carrying away waste products. So imbalances caused by um, illnesses or altered fluid intake, prolonged vomiting, diarrhea, lots of things can cause imbalances. Um, examples that you see above, I, I put a picture of chemotherapy there. If you have pr uh, metastatic breast cancer, that causes hypercalcemia, just the disease itself. Then we give chemo, and that often causes nausea and vomiting, which will cause decreased sodium. So then we give IV fluids, but that could cause fluid overload. So you can see how those all work together, and we're constantly thinking about fluid and electrolytes in our nursing care. So lots of things. Dialysis is another thing that will really affect the homeostasis of our fluids. So ultimately our goal is for intake and output to be equal and that would be taking into account all the losses that we have through other things like the skin, the respiratory system, the GI system. Water, primary fluid in the body, more important to life than any other nutrient. We can survive only a few days without water because almost all the physiologic reactions or processes occur only in a watery environment. Water delivers the electrolytes and nutrients and carries away the waste. It's a solvent, it's a lubricant, it's a cushion for our joints. It helps us regulate body temperature and certainly helps us um, maintain blood volume. Water balance is affected by a lot of things, but particularly age, gender, muscle mass. Muscle has more water in it. Fat, fat, fat cells have less water. 60% of an adult's, adult's body weight is water. It's more in a child. It's less in the elderly. So why is that important? That means those populations are at higher risk of fluid electrolyte imbalances. Same thing like obese, they have less total body water than a lean person. Women have less total body water than men, so it affects the balance. Daily need is two to 3,000 mils. Many, many times um, students will put on their care plan, encourage increased fluid intake. And so I ask them, well, how much would be increased fluid intake? And they don't know what the normal is. So it's really important that you know daily fluid intake need is about 2,000 to 3,000 mils, 2,000 on the low side. And then, of course, based on body conditions, things like fever or increased metabolism, we will need more than that amount. Remember that water is found in foods, too, but it is not found in alcohol. Alcohol actually acts as a diuretic, so it will dehydrate you. Bummer, huh? And then lastly, one liter of water weighs one kilogram. Why would we find that to be important? Remember, um, sudden changes in body weight are a great indicator of fluid balance. It's actually the best indicator of fluid balance is a sudden change of body weight. So fluid intake and loss, we've kind of touched on this just a little bit, but I wanted to remind you what the intake sources are and the loss sources or loss routes are. So intake is primarily regulated through our thirst drive, 
which is triggered by rising blood osmolality or a decreasing blood volume. But this doesn't work for everyone. If someone's in a coma, their thirst can't be stimulated. And if it was, they wouldn't be able to respond to that. We also get fluids from metabolic processes. So we get it from things we don't necessarily think of. So primarily our intake comes 60% from just liquids we take in, 30% from the solid foods we have, and then 10% from metabolic water. Fluid loss primarily comes from the kidneys. It's closely regulated and adjustable. But what is the minimum amount of urine per day that lets you get rid of waste? Because that's important. It's something we test on sometimes, and that's usually 400 to 600 milliliters. So, you know, our kidneys will concentrate or dilute the urine as needed to maintain fluid balance. So our fluid loss routes, 60% is from the urine, 28% is what's called insensible losses from our skin, from our lungs, um, from the GI tract, and then 8% is from sweat, 4% from feces. So insensible water loss is really important because it can be very significant in like a trauma or burns, extreme stress, fever, breathing quickly like tachypnea, being ventilated on a ventilator, those kind of things really, really increase fluid loss. The other thing on the right side of this screen is intake and, impact, intake and output and what it is and should be measurable and then what it isn't. So this gives you a new perspective because I find that oftentimes students are confused as to what really goes into intake and output. So in intake, certainly what we take in, but also tube feedings parenteral fluid, so all of your IV fluids, including your piggybacks, enemas, and any retained irrigation fluid. If we put fluid in and it dwells, and then it's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to come out through a Foley, for example, that needs to be measured as intake. Now, we can't measure the intake from solid foods, like the waters from that, or from metabolism. On output, we should be measuring urine, emesis if we can, feces when we can especially if it's liquid and then drainage from any body cavity so that would be drains or wounds um, suction that kind of stuff and then remember the things we can't measure sweating and then the loss that we get from our lungs from breathing too fast electrolytes electrolytes are chemicals dissolved in body fluid um, and then their distribution affects fluid balance. We commonly measure them in milliequivalents, and they include salts, acids, bases, and some proteins. And these proteins particularly have a lot of osmotic power. Now, we also have non-electrolytes, and sometimes we confuse this. Things like glucose, lipids, creatinine, urea, those are all non-electrolytes. They do not have an electrical charge and don't dissociate in water. They do affect water balance, but they're not considered electrolytes. Um, the normal range of electrolytes is very narrow, so even very small changes can cause big problems. Where do we get most of our electrolytes? And then what controls it? We get it mostly from food, and the kidneys control most of the electrolytes by excreting them or by reabsorbing them. Two major electrolytes we talk about the most are sodium, which is the major extracellular electrolyte, controls water balance, and then potassium, the major intracellular electrolyte, and it does maintain intracellular water balance and then transmits nerve impulses and cardiac impulses. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. So I just listed a few fluid and electrolyte labs. On the uh, disorder section, we'll actually talk about these in detail, but I just kind of put a summary here. So first of all, when we draw labs, are we drawing that blood? Are we calculating the values from the extracellular fluid or from the intracellular fluid? because it's important to know, and it's the extracellular fluid. Um, also, we'll talk about what is involved in the BMP and the CMP. But let me cover these real quick. Sodium. 
Normals 135 to 45, 145. By the way, the normals vary from lab to lab a little bit and from book to book. So this might be slightly different than your textbook, but these are kind of the normal accepted values out there. Um, and you really need to know basically where the number is, not every single exact high and low. So sodium determines whether water is retained, excreted, or moved. Imbalances in sodium cause neuro problems. Always think neuro. High or low, that will be the problem. Potassium, increased when we have poor kidney function, decreased when we have diarrhea, vomiting, too much urination, and imbalances cause cardiac problems. Always associate potassium with cardiac. Again, high or low. Chloride, we don't talk about it a whole lot. Normal 96 to 106. It works with sodium to maintain that osmotic pressure. So when we see sodium, sodium and chloride always together. So we, de we see it increase with poor kidney function, decrease with vomiting and diarrhea. Chloride is also really important in uh, maintaining acid-base balance. A couple more, calcium 9.0 to 10.5 helps with transmission of nerve impulses. Heart, it does affect the heart not just the muscles and bones and it also affects blood clotting and if you'll remember it requires vitamin D in order to absorb it and then phosphate 3.0 to 4.5 typically you don't have to memorize that one but it is important to know that the balance is intertwined with calcium so if we have a change in phosphate levels we'll have an equal and opposite change in calcium it's an inverse relationship or reciprocal relationship um, other tests we see when we think about fluid electrolytes, BUN, 6 to 20, creatinine, 0 0.6 to 1.3, both of those tell us about kidney function. Now when you're dehydrated, you have a fluid imbalance, sometimes those numbers aren't completely accurate because it's based on, on hydration and water percents. Uh, hematocrit, same thing are really affected by hydration. So we have a slightly different number for males and females. Males are a little bit higher, females a little bit lower. And then total protein and albumin are important in fluid electrolytes because they can pull fluid and cause fluid exchange. We'll typically talk about a basic metabolic panel, a BMP, which includes the basic electrolytes, sodium, potassium, uh, CO2 and chloride, and then glucose and calcium and BUN and creatinine. The CMP, or the Complete Metabolic Panel, has all of the same things as the BMP, but also has albumin and total protein, and then it has the liver enzymes, ALP, ALT, AST, and bilirubin. You don't really ever need to memorize the liver enzymes, except to know you know, like the highs or the thousands, and then to recognize that those, those letters are liver enzymes. Now, I love this. I found this in, I think, Memory Magic, Memory Cards with Mosby. But this is Lab Normals, memorizing it by the ma Magic 4. It's just a quick way to keep the normal straight in your head. I never suggest you memorize ranges. When you memorize ranges, you have to memorize two numbers for every one. I more suggest you memorize that middle number. And that's exactly what this table does. So. It takes all of the basics, potassium chloride, sodium, pH, PCO2 from a blood gas, and uh, bicarb from a blood gas, and it helps you learn them by fours. I think it's a great idea. It's basically the middle number. Sometimes the range is slightly off from your normal, but it still gives you a great basic number, so you only memorize that number on the far side. And then another little hint on the bottom that the hematocrit normal is three times the hemoglobin. So you memorize hemoglobin, then you know hematocrit. Osmolarity and osmolality. This is um, a term that lots of people are confused by, and that's because the terms are often used interchangeably. So from this point on, I'm going to just say osmo, so we don't confuse it. So technically, though, osmolarity is particles per liter and osmolality is particles per kilogram. And it's really just a slightly different calculation and you hear mo both terms out there and most labs report it as osmolality. But it's really more important that you pay attention to whether it's a serum osmo or a urine osmo because those can be quite different. 
What Osmo measures is the concentration of dissolved particles, and it's mostly determined by sodium, glucose, and BUN. So it really is looking at a solute to water ratio. Um, urine osmo tells us the concentrating ability of the kidneys and if there's a problem with ADH. It's really a better calculation of urine concentration than specific gravity is. So if you look at the slide, you see that serum osmo is 285 to 295. High is water deficit or concentrated blood. Low is water excess or more dilute. And the same thing is true for urine. But the urine osmo, you see the numbers are very big, 50 to 1,200. I mean, like, what's the point of even learning that? So the average that you see for urine osmo is 500 to 800. More importantly, we use that urine osmo to compare with the serum osmo. And then this tells us how well the kidneys are working to remove the water and the electrolytes from the blood. And it really helps us determine what might be causing a sodium imbalance, whether it's fluid problem or whether it's a kidney problem. So the normal ratio of uh, urine to serum osmo is a 1 to 3 ratio. So as one rises, or lowers, the other should too. And if it doesn't, again, that helps the doctors determine what's causing the problem. So let's look at a little more patho um, to further understand the osmo issue. So water is divided into two spaces, the intracellular fluid, the fluid inside the cells, and the ECF, the extracellular fluid, the fluid outside of the cells. So the cells need to maintain a balance of two-thirds body fluids inside the cell and a third body fluid outside the cell. If we have too much water that enters the cell, then it can rupture. And if too much water leaves it, then the cell can dehydrate and collapse. And it's the movement of major minerals that controls that movement of water. So we move negative and positive ions in and out. And when those electrolytes move, so does the water. So as you see above, the intracellular fluid is primarily potassium and phosphate, and then the extracellular is primarily sodium and chloride. Extracellular fluid is where we do our blood draws and get our lab values, and it, it includes the interstitial, transcellular, and the intravascular fluids. So interstitial fluid is the fluid between the cells. We sometimes call it the third space, and that's around the blood, lymph, bone, connective tissue, and then transcellular fluids. Transcellular fluids are areas that's in, that are enclosed by membranes, like the CSF, pleural fluids, peritoneal joint fluids. And then intravascular fluid is really the, our blood plasma. So the osmolality of all body fluids is are supposed to be equal. So when we have a change in solute concentration, an electrolyte change, that's quickly going to be followed by an osmotic change, usually in the extracellular fluid. And then once we have a change in those electrolytes, that's where we tend to also have acid-base problems. Oh, do you remember this from patho? You really don't need to know this very much, so I'm just going to quickly remind you of these. I, I can't imagine people are going to test you on this in nursing school. So. Remembering that fluid and electrolytes are constantly shifting from compartment to compartment to allow all those body processes. And because we have cell membranes that separate these body fluid compartments, you know, water can pass through those because they're permeable. However, molecules and the electrolytes pass through them more slowly. And they pass through through those four mechanisms. So filtration is differences in water volume, really hydrostatic pressure, water pushing pressure, moving fluids through the membrane. So this is usually through the cell and vessel walls. We typically see this as edema. Diffusion is like melting a lump of sugar into a cup of water, and it's really important in transport of gases. Sometimes it requires a transport system, what we call it facilitated diffusion, Things like insulin and glucose. Glucose can't move through on its own and needs in, uh, insulin. So it's really similar to filtration, but it's more movement of particles and movement of fluid.
Osmosis is the movement of water only between two compartments and we use this when we talk about hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic fluids. It's what causes cells to shrink or swell. Um, thirst is an example of that or sweating. It causes if we're thirsty or we're sweating it causes the cells to shrink and then it makes us thirsty and we see that process. And then finally active transport. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, molecules have to move against the concentration gradient, so it requires some energy and the use of some sort of system, a pump. So the typical one we talk about is the sodium potassium pump, which requires ATP and it moves both substances in opposite di directions. So we use active transport primarily to control cell volume and intracellular concentration. Now regulation of water balance, this is important for you to understand and understand how this works. Because fluids are what maintains our, blo our blood volume and that's what maintains our blood pressure. So we see this talked about a lot in use of drugs, in cardiovascular particularly. So we have the kidneys both listed on to the left there and there are major regulatory organ of fluid balance. Then the hypothalamus which stimulates thirst and then ultimately the endocrine system helps control the fluid and electrolyte balance too when the pituitary releases ADH, the adrenal cortex releases aldosterone and then even the heart gets involved by releasing these natriuretic peptides. So let's go back to the kidneys on the far left. So the kidneys release renin when those juxta, uh, juxtaglomerular cells, JG cells, sense low sodium or low blood volume. And then this begins the, the RAS, R-A-A-S, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So the renin's released and then that converts to angio, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 which then using the lungs converts to angiotensin 2 and then that stimulates release of aldosterone and that then we move to the next column over so that's one part of the kidneys. The kidneys also have the adrenal cortex which also senses low serum osmo or low sodium and releases aldosterone so we can have the aldosterone released directly from the adrenal cortex or we can have it released also uh, through those JG cells stimulating the renin angiotensin system. Nevertheless, aldosterone does the same thing. So when aldosterone is released, it causes the body to retain sodium in the blood and then excrete potassium in the urine. And because that sodium causes osmotic or water pulling pressure, water will try to follow the sodium. So it does help remove some of the the water. So all of this ultimately increases serum osmo. Um, so aldosterone protects sodium balance by preventing us from losing any more sodium and then it also helps with water balance because water follows sodium. Now the hypothalamus will sense high serum osmo or high sodium and it stimulates thirst. And remember once again if someone's in a coma the thirst stimulation won't really help them because they, they won't, won't be able to act on that. But it also stimulates release of ADH, also called antidiuretic hormone or called vasopressin. And that comes from the posterior pituitary. ADH works the opposite of aldosterone by causing the body to retain water and then it concentrates the urine which overall will decrease serum osmo. It also mildly constricts blood vessels so it can raise the blood pressure just a little bit. ADH is a good example of negative feedback so as the water level decreases ADH will increase and vice versa. Now the heart, the heart senses particularly high volume and it can certainly sense low volume but we usually talk about it in terms of the high volume. So it senses high volume through the stretch receptors in the right atrium primarily, some in the ventricles and it will secrete ANP from the right atrium or BNP from the ventricles. And these are those natriuretic peptides. These inhibit ADH. It stops the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and causes the kidney to stop reabsorbing sodium and increases 
urine output and then there's higher urine higher sodium excretion through that urine it also dilates blood vessels which will decrease blood volume decrease serum osmo um, so it has a different effect than the others do but those are the four ways that the body regulates water balance fluid spacing I cover this because I think people hear these terms all the time and don't know what they really mean the first spacing and second spacing and third spacing so when we have capillary or interstitial pressure changes fluid shifts from a, one compartment to another like with we have albumin can move fluid decrease protein causes third spacing when these fluid shifts occur then those pressures are altered those fluid interstitial pressures are altered and we get things like edema or dehydration first spacing is normal normal distribution of fluid in ICF and the ECF so nothing wrong when they use the term first spacing second spacing is an abnormal accumulation of interstitial fluid it's what we typically think of as edema as you see in the upper right picture and then third spacing is where fluid is trapped in a part of the body where it can't be easily exchanged with extracellular fluid so it's trapped like we see in this picture ascites um, edema with burns the fluid is trapped and it's really not available for use so typically edema itself is caused by increased venous hydrostatic pressure fluid overload heart failure tourniquets um, we can have decreased plasma pressure oncotic pressure so fluid can't be brought back into the capillaries with low protein and renal problems and then we could have increased interstitial oncotic pressure where the capillary walls are damaged and proteins accumulate like in trauma and burns and um, we can also have strange fluid movement by giving things like colloids and mannitol and hypertonic solutions which we'll talk about next we can also increase tissue hydrostatic pressure by applying TEDs or sequential compression devices um, which are actually a good thing that helps move, move fluid out so real quickly I'm going to cover uh, IV fluids and their types you should have this in other other lectures but it makes sense to put it here too so just a reminder of your types of fluids isotonic or crystalloids they're equal to body fluid and keep fluid in the intravascular volume without causing any kind of fluid shift from a compartment excuse me for changing that um, these are usually used for replacement or maintenance fluids so normal saline d5w or lactated ringers now just a caution d5w if you give it fast will become hypotonic because dextrose is rapidly metabolized into water and carbon dioxide but generally isotonic keeps the fluid exactly like it should as you see in the middle picture hypertonic fluid is thicker than body fluid is the easy way to remember it and it will shift fluid into the blood plasma by moving fluid from the tissue cells it will pull it out and ultimately it causes cells to shrink so we usually use it when we replace electrolytes or with hyponatremia but the big risk of this is fluid overload so the hypertonic fluids are 3% normal saline or 3% saline d5 and a half normal saline and d10w hypotonic are thinner than body fluids and these shift fluids from the intravascular to the tissue cells so we usually use this when we need to hydrate cells get them bigger but we have to be careful because it can deplete the circulatory system and this would be a fluid like half normal saline now the plasma expanders are interesting things like albumin and colloids albumin causes osmotic or oncotic pressure which tends to keep the fluid in the intravascular compartment by pulling water from the interstitial space back into the capillaries so we have colloids like volume expanders or dextrin solutions head of starch plasminate 
just a reminder about some of these, dextrin is not a substitute for whole blood because it doesn't have any products that can carry oxygen. Head of starch is actually isotonic and can decrease platelet hematocrit crit counts and is contraindicated in like bleeding disorders, congestive heart failure, or kidney failure. Plasmine can be used instead of plasma or albumin to replace body protein. And then you know our blood and blood products, whole blood, packed red blood cells, plasma and albumin, and then lipids. Those are the fat solutions that we typically use when they're going to have IV therapy for longer than five days. So again, that was just a very quick and dirty reminder of IV fluids. Just quickly, I want to cover two more things. Um, gerontologic considerations, just what happens in older people that's different in terms of fluid and electrolyte system. First of all, the percent of body weight of water uh, is decreased down to about 45 to 50 percent instead of up to 60 percent. And that's mostly because of decreased muscle mass, but the important thing is this puts them at greater risk for dehydration. They also have many, many kidney changes. So they don't have as much renin and aldosterone, so the body can't retain sodium as well or excrete potassium. They have too much ADH, so more water is reabsorbed. They have an increased ANP, so they have more sodium and water excreted, which all of these serve to lower blood volume and blood pressure. They have loss of subcutaneous tissue, so that means they have increased loss of moisture through the skin and that skin turgor assessment is not accurate in an older person. So instead of skin turgor, what can we use to assess fluid and electrolyte balance? Eyes and nose, daily weights. Um, musculoskeletal changes, it might mean they are unable to hold a glass, so they're less likely to get the hydration they need. Mental status changes, they may be confused, they may dis be disoriented, and again, not be able to get the fluids that they need. And then incontinence occurs with aging, a lot of times with body changes, but in terms of fluid balance, oftentimes it will make older people withhold fluid intake, so they won't have problems with incontinence, so they end up becoming dehydrated trying to prevent the incontinence. Some assessment considerations in terms of history, ask their nutrition status, ask their nutrition history, a diet history for the last three days, ask about eyes and nose, insensible losses, remember breathing fast, lots of sweating, do they use diuretics, do they use laxatives, do they use them daily, multiple times a day, have they had weight changes, whether they're expected or unexpected. Do they have kidney or endocrine disorders? Endocrine affects fluid and electrolytes a lot. What's their level of consciousness? Do they have any mental status changes? And also depression, eating disorders, alcohol intake. All of those can greatly affect fluid status. And we affect fluids, we affect electrolytes. Physically, look at their hydration status through skin turgor, except maybe in an elderly patient. Um, mucous membranes, are they pink? Are they wet? Not lips, look at the inside of the mouth. And then eyes and nose, certainly in a hospital, strict eyes and nose. And then lastly, the diagnostic tests, we've mentioned a lot of them. There's also some acid-based ones on here, but electrolyte levels, BUN, glucose, creatinine, pH, bicarb, osmo, hemoglobin, hematocrit, all the things we've talked about. So watch for more videos coming soon. The electrolyte disorders should be soon. Um, maybe I'll add some videos or games on the website, so keep your eyes open for that and watch for more different types of videos and even our app coming soon. As always, we appreciate your feedback. So, in fact, fluid and electrolytes came from a member asking for that to be posted. So that's why it's here. So suggest topics, ask us questions, like or dislike our videos, definitely share our videos, and please subscribe so you'll get, get the videos first. Thanks for watching.